الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد إخوة الإسلام عباد الله as advertised the subject of this particular lecture is the phenomena of fatherless homes and its impact on the family structure. And its impact on the family structure. Now when, when looking at this particular topic, I like to quote some statistics that illustrate uh, some of the harms of fatherless of fa that are found with or connected to fatherless homes. Now, I need children being raised by single parents, specifically by mothers. One of the statistics found with the U.S. Department of Justice in a special report that they did in 1988 that is still constantly quoted in this day and time is that they found that 90% of homeless runaways are from fatherless homes. 90%, 90% of homeless runaway children, yani preteens and teenagers, are from fatherless homes. They found that, yani, 75% of children in fatherless homes are more prone to drug and alcohol abuse. Are more, are more prone to drug and alcohol abuse. And as a result, they end up in adolescent patient, uh, adolescent patients and chemical abuse centers. Adolescent patient and chemical abuse centers. They found that 63% of youth suicides are from children coming out of fatherless homes. 71% of pregnant teenagers are from fatherless homes. These particular stati statistics, in reality, are staggering. They're staggering as it relates, and they illustrate, uh, as it relates to the situation of fatherless homes, the severe impact that it has on the children. Now, when looking at the demographics, Yanni, the numbers as it relates to varying ethnic groups within the U.S. that are suffering from this, then we're looking at white homes, white families or white homes, only 25% from amongst white people are, there's only 25% that are suffering from fatherless homes, which is less than half. Hispanic homes make up 42%. They make up 42%. Black homes, however, make up 67%. In a black community, there's 67% as it relates to homes out of the black community that are fatherless, that are fatherless homes. Now, why is this relevant? 
Because as I look around the room, I can't say the majority are black Americans. Every single last individual in this room is a black American. And so, although we've accepted Islam, oh, with the exception of the brother over here, I didn't see him, I have a little feet. But the point that I'm making is, with the exception of, uh, excuse me, as a result of us accepting Islam, that doesn't mean that these social ills disappear. That don't mean that these social ills within society disappear. Although we accept Islam, striving to better ourselves and thus forth and so on, these social and, and, and economic ills that are within the society still linger and still exist. And because we're from this demographic, it affects us in one way or the other. It affects us in one way or the other. Especially if we are individuals that enter into Islam and don't change our outlook on how we approach, view, and understand how we should deal within this society. Within this society. So when Dealing with this situation of fatherless homes and its impact on the family structure, I like to quote an authentic narration that is Mutafakun Alay. And it is upon the authority of Ibn Umar. And our brother Abu Har, uh, Hafizullah, he quoted it in his speech. Where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he stated, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an nur'iyyatihi. That all of you all are shepherds and all of you all will be questioned about your flock or about uh, uh, concerning his flock. Al-Imam ra'in, the leader, the head of state, the ruler, he is a shepherd. And he will be questioned about those that are under his authority. He will be questioned about that. And the man is a shepherd over his family, those that are in his home. And he will be questioned about those that are under his care. Wal Mara Ra'iyatun Wa Mesulatun Anu Ra'iyatiha Afwan Al Mara Ra'iyatun Baiti Zaujiha that the woman, she is a shepherd as it relates to the home of her husband. And in another narration or chain of transmission, it states, That the and the woman is a shepherd over the home of her husband and his children and will be questioned about her responsibility. And the servant is Yani a shepherd or caretaker over the wealth of his master and he will be questioned about his responsibility. So all of you all are shepherds and all of you all will be questioned about your flocks or about your responsibilities. 
الحافظ الحافظ ابن حجر الأصقلاني he stays في هذا الحديث well, let me stop right there let me stop right there I want to read from the statements of الشيخ محمد ابن صالح الأثيمين ورحمة الله تعالى عليه concerning this particular statement or this particular narration because in order to combat fatherless homes within the Muslim community it's incumbent upon us to understand the position of the father in the home the position the, the position of the father in the home and the advantage that a home has with a father therein. And when we understand this, then we start to understand the disadvantage of a home that's fatherless. That's fatherless. So as Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymin, he states, Al Khitab lil Umma Jami'an, Yubayinu fihi al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. أن كل إنسان راع ومسؤول عن رعيته. That this address is to the Ummah, the Islamic nation, to all of it, to every single individual within the Islamic nation. In it, the, the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he makes explicitly clear that every single individual is a caretaker, is a custodian, every single individual. And he will be held responsible for those that are placed under his care, for those that are placed under his care. Now, now we go to the statement of al Hafiz. To bring us further, to help us further contextualize the statement of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymin. When looking at the status or the stature of, of those that are considered to be caretakers or custodians, or custodians over others. الحافظ he states في هذا الحديث أن الراعي ليس مطلوبا لذاته وإنما أقيم لحفظ ما استرعاه المالك فينبغي أن لا يتصرف إلا بما أذن الشارع فيه Now he states that in this particular narration the caretaker or the shepherd he is not requested on account of himself. Meaning a person doesn't hire someone to be a shepherd to watch over himself. That's not being requested from him. On the contrary, he is only hired to uphold the safeguarding of those who he's been requested to safeguard, that the owner of those animals is hiring him to safeguard, is hiring him to be the shepherd of. That's why he's there. That's why he's there. He's not there on account of himself. He's not being requested to protect himself. He's being requested to protect others, to safeguard others to ensure the safety and well-being of others. And so he, he continues, and in this case, yani when Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala places any human being in that particular situation, then it is incumbent upon him to act in a way, to not act in any way except that which Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala is legislated. Because he says the legislator, the legislator is Allah. There's no, there, there is, 
that this individual cannot behave in a manner in any way except that which Allah has allowed or Allah has permitted as it relates to the caretaking of those that he is responsible for of those that he is responsible for <coughs> so Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala he is the one that makes individuals caretakers of others he's the one that assigns these <coughs> roles and Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala clearly assigned the role of caretaker over a family structure to the man, to the husband, to the father, to the husband of, the, of, of, of a wife or wives, and the children that are produced from that wife or those wives by Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala's permission. This is whom Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala has designated to be the caretaker in this regard. And this, as a result, is a, is a trust that the man has to fulfill to its people. Allah has commissioned him with this responsibility or entrusted him with this responsibility. And it is incumbent upon him to fulfill it. As Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, he states, in Allah يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَن تُؤَدُّوا الْأَمَانَاتِ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهَا الْآيَةِ That indeed Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala has commanded you all to fulfill or discharge the trust to its rightful people. To its rightful people. Ibn Kathir, or Rahmatullahi Ta'ala alayhi, he states that this particular verse is general. وَهَذَا يَعُمُّ جَمِيعَ that it is inclusive of all trusts, all obligatory trusts. And he states that. Oh, he gives some examples yani as it relates to the rights of Allah from the prayer and the pain of the zakat and the fasting and putting forth expiations for certain sins uh, and fulfilling oaths and thus forth and so on or, or yani from other than that from those things that a person has been entrusted to fulfill from those things that a person has been entrusted to fulfill to Allah, to Baraka wa Ta'ala. And likewise, وَمِنْ حُقُوقِ الْعِبَادِ بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَيْ بَعْضٍ And likewise, from the rights of the servants. Those rights that some have over others. That some have over others. One of the things that Ibn Kathir is pointing out, he's doing away with the misunderstanding that most people have concerning the verse. As most people apply this verse to people in governmental authority, the head of state or governors or people of that nature, judges in the, in the Islamic court, and thus forth and so on. But the verse is more general than that. And he gives an example showing that it's applicable to each and every one of us. Why? Because Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala has rights over every single one of us. And this verse is showing that we have to fulfill those rights that are made binding upon us to fulfill to our Lord. So it's not just applicable 
to the authority fulfilling the rights of those under his authority. It's applicable to all of us. And likewise, it's applicable as it relates to the, to the servants fulfilling the rights of, those, of others besides us who have rights over us. Who have rights over us. The point is that Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala is the one that designated or specified or determined, determined these rights. He is the one that determined who fulfills the rights and who receives this right. Who receives this right. And this is very important because when looking, going back to that hadith again, Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, he states, Ar-rajul ra'in ala ahli baytihi wa mas'ulun an ra'iyatihi. That the man is a shepherd or a caretaker or a custodian over his family. And he will be questioned about that responsibility. He will be questioned about that responsibility. This responsibility, Ya Ibadullah, has been designated by one who is or who has complete knowledge. One who to whom which there is nothing hidden from him as it relates to his knowledge and understanding. One who is well acquainted with everything. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, he says about himself, Kul atu'allimun Allah bidinikum wa huwa ya'lamu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim. Say, do you teach Allah about your deen? When Allah has knowledge of whatsoever is in the heavens and whatsoever is in the earth. And Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala as it relates to everything is all knowing. Is all knowing. This name Al Ali, <laughs> it points to the to an attribute of knowledge that Allah wa is the possessor, a possessor of vast knowledge, but knowledge of the of, a, of the entirety of a thing, <coughs> of a, the entirety of a thing. As some of us gain knowledge of a particular field, some may go to college or university get a, get a, and go as far as to get a PhD in a particular science. But that doesn't mean he has an understanding of every single intricacy as it relates to that science. His knowledge is deficient. But this name Al-Alim is pointing to the fact that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala is has full knowledge of the entirety of a thing. Now, when looking at that and understanding that, <clears throat> then we understand or we look at the fact that if his knowledge is like that as, as it relates to a particular thing, on top of that, he is the one that has full knowledge of everything within the creation. يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ He knows whatsoever is in the heavens and whatsoever is in the earth. When we look at the name Al-Khabir, normally translated as the one who is well acquainted, this name points to the attribute of knowledge of the most, of the innermost of a thing. The inner core of a thing, the most minute of a thing, things that are 
around us but are unknown to us because of how small they may be. This name is, 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 is pointing to that aspect of his knowledge. This is the one who has designated who should fulfill these rights, who fulfills them, and who receives them. This is the one that has designated that. When looking at Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala and understanding this aspect of him yani as it relates to his knowledge, then we understand that the best position for any household to be in is that a father should be in that home. A father should be in that home in order for that family to be successful, in order for that family to have an advantage. <coughs> and so we can't talk about yani, the well-being of our children if we're not discussing the harms of a father being outside the home. There's no way we can have this discussion and we have a community where the majority or half or even 20% or 10% because that's too much. 10% of the community are fatherless homes. <clears throat> Continuing with the statement of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymeen, he says, Warari, and he's going into the definition of a Rari, uh, as we're translating as shepherd or caretaker or custodian. He says, he is the one that establishes for, uh, for something. Uh, yani, uh, he yani, uh, takes care of, of or watches over yani, the well-being of that thing. And he arranges or puts in order that which is beneficial for that thing, for lack of better translation. <clears throat> and likewise, he observes or take heed of the harms to that thing. He is observing of what is harmful to that thing. And as a result, he makes sure that those harmful things are far away from that thing that's under his care. That thing that's under his care. And then he continues, just like the shepherd as it relates to a flock of goats. Just like a shepherd as it relates to a flock of goats. As he examines and searches for a suitable pasture for those animals. Until he is able to lead those animals to that pasture. Because he recognizes that this is in the best well-being for, for that flock of goats or sheep and thus far for so on. This pasture that's sweet and green is of benefit for them. But before he leads them there, he examines it. Are there any snakes in the grass? Is there anything within this pasture that may be harmful? to this flock, this is the job and the responsibility of a shepherd. And likewise, as Sheikh Uthamin continues, he looks at if the place is of the pasture or the, or the areas is a place that's barren. And if it is barren, he does not leave or abandon those animals in this type of place. 
because this type of place would be harmful for those animals. They're not going to be able to nourish themselves in a place like that. In a place like that. This is what is understood by kullukum ra'in. This is the responsibility for those that are considered a caretaker of another. The similitude that the Prophet <coughs> gave as it relates to a shepherd and the duties of a shepherd are exactly suitable for all those that are considered caretakers over others. Including a man over his family. The man over his family. Just looking at this statement of Al Shaykh Muhammad ibn Saleh Al Uthaymin or Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alay gives us an understanding of how a home without a father is disadvantaged. <coughs> is disadvantaged. Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala in his infinite wisdom and knowledge placed a man in this role and responsibility. So there's no doubt that no one can fulfill or handle this responsibility except the man, except the husband, except the father. Al Hafiz ibn Hajar al Asqalani, he also came with a definition for al-ra'i and is very similar to al-shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymin. And in fact, because al-hafid lived before Shaykh Uthaymin by centuries, then it is not far-fetched to say that Shaykh Uthaymin learned the definition that he presented from those that preceded him in scholarship. But he states, huwa al-hafiz, al-mu'tamin, al-multazim, salah ma wa'tamanu ala hifdihi. He states, he is the one that is a protector of, uh, yani, one who, uh, he is an entrusted protector. Yani, committed under an obligation of the well-being of those who have who have been entrusted under his care. Of those that he has been entrusted to safeguard or to protect. So what is demanded from him is justice in caring and protecting those under his care and establishing that which is a maslaha for those that are under his care. Now, last time I was here, we uh, had the lecture series when we dealt with certain principles. And during the course of that lecture, those lectures, I stated what a maslaha is from the Islamic perspective. With a maslaha, what I normally translate, it, translate as benefit. But there was a clear Islamic technical definition. Anybody, was anybody here for those lectures? Uh, uh, well, let me rephrase the question. Anybody that was here for those lectures, do they remember the definition for maslaha? Anyone? You were here? Were you here? No? Danielle, you were here. You remember the definition? Anyone else? The definition that was given, It is all of that. It includes all of that, which, yani, safeguards the five, Yani al usul al khamsa the five, yani sacred things. It's normally translated as sacred things. Al daruriyat al khams al khamsa the five yani <laughs> sacred things. That being, the ad-din being the first, 
What's the second? Life. Wealth, life, yeah. Asr. Akil, and Nasr, progeny. Adin being at the top, and Nef, so the life being after that. Yani al Akil being after life, and Nasr being after Akil, and al Mal or wealth being after the world. This is what. The Ra'in or the caretaker or the shepherd is entrusted with protecting as relates to those that are under his care. As relates to those that are under his care. When understanding and looking at that, then it gives us an understanding of the statement of Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala when he says, Yeah, Aminu, Ku and Fusakum wa Ahli Kum Naran, Wa Kudu Hen Nasu al Hijara al Aya. Where he says, O oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your families from a fire. If we understand that this is the responsibility of the Ra'in, and in the case of the family, the husband, the man, then it gives us a better understanding of the intent of this statement of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. This is something that the man has been entrusted to safeguard. Thus the man is the authority over the home. And without some sort of authority, even if a goal is actualized, then it may be actualized with unnecessary difficulties or it may be impossible to actualize Aslan. An example of this would be that of people that are in a patient's home. People that need to be you know, in 24 hour constant care. How can the well-being <coughs> of patients in a nursing home be established if you have no nurse? Everybody having a different need, but the authority or the one held responsible to care for the, all the, these varying people, people and their need is a nurse. Yet the nursing home is absent of that nurse. How can the well-being of these patients be safeguarded? You may have some people within that nursing home that can't even wipe their own behind. <laughs> And need a nurse to tell a CNA or LVN or whoever else to direct them on what they need to do in order to ensure that that, that, that patient well being that patient's well being is safeguarded. If you we have the example of a pilot and a co pilot. A co pilot is not on the same level as a as a pilot. A co-pilot doesn't have the same skills as a pilot. A co-pilot may be able to land the plane. But if he lands the plane by causing damage to the plane, the wheels and thus forth and so on, and it's a rough landing and causes passengers on the plane to become injured, even though the plane has landed, then we understand that the responsibility that was given to the co-pilot in this regard was a responsibility that, that was not befitting for them. And this is the reality of single mother homes. This is the reality of single mother homes. 
And this is something that we as Muslims have to recognize. Brothers and sisters, we have to, ha we have to look down on being in a situation or being complicit in a situation that creates a single mother home or fatherless home. My father, and I'm, I just turned 41 a couple of days ago, so my father's about 22 or 23 years older than me. He told me that when he was a boy coming up, there was no home here in America in the black community, except that it had a man and woman in it, either the mother and father or the mother and the stepfather. But that there was a man in the home. This is in stark contrast to what we see happening today. And because these statistics that I mentioned in the beginning is a problem, the percentage is yani, more than half within the black community, then sometimes when we enter into Islam, we carry that <laughs> stuff over with us. The thinking that leads to that. The actions that lead to that. And so we want we we want to have to to change our understanding in that regard. Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala He teaches us that the men are qawamun over the women they're qawamun over the women on account of Allah giving preference to some over others yani the men over the women and on account that they spend from their wealth. Yani the men spend from their wealth yani in order to maintain the women. I want you to listen to the statement of Ibn Kathir when he explains <coughs> the intent to show us the tremendous responsibility and, and the tremendous status of a father and husband. And this explanation is a means to further illustrate the point that I'm making that a fatherless home is a disadvantaged home. This is how we need to look at that in order to rectify this. Ibn Kathir, or Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi states, yani al-rajul qayyim al mar'a, yani the man, he is the one that is in charge, or has authority over the woman. Yani he's a caretaker, he's the custodian over her. A huwa ra'isuha wa kabiruha. والحاكم عليها ومؤدبها إذا عوجت. Meaning he is her head, he is her leader. هو رئيسها. رئيس is usually, we usually hear that, يعني term, the head of the, the country, the leader, the ruler. He stay oh, the the head of an administration, the head of the administration. This is what Ibn Kathir is saying <coughs> that that the man is for the woman. He's her rais. He's her senior. He's a judge over her. And he is the one that corrects her whenever she starts to stray. 
whenever she starts to stray. So in looking at that, then it's incumbent upon us to, to accept the status of the man as it relates to the family structure and to reject all ideas that oppose that. Why? Because the one who particularized this duty for the man, the one who particularized it is one who is, as it relates to knowledge and wisdom, free from all flaw and defect. Free from all flaw and defect. Unfortunately, when we start to hear things like this, because of the society, um, we start to look at the, these things in a negative manner. There's a white Range Rover, whoever's driving it, can they please move it? Park, but you're being requested to move your Range Rover. Now, as I was saying, when we hear about, or when we hear things of this nature that I just mentioned, because of this society and the, uh, what time is it? 640. 640, what time did I begin? I began at 5, okay. Because of the society that we are raised in, when speech of this nature is made, it's usually frowned upon. From one of the corrupt ideologies that are prevalent and present in this particular society that has a negative effect on the Muslims and the, fam and the Muslim family structure is the idea that men and women are equal. That men and women are equal. Now, or the idea of equality. Now, so we all understand what's being said here. The Webster's English Dictionary meaning of equality is as follows. The state of being equal especially in status, rights, and opportunities. <coughs> the state of being equal in status, rights, and opportunities. Now this particular call of equality came as a result of the atrocities that were found in American history from the slave trade, from chattel slavery, where uh, black, black folks were considered to be inferior. And as a result, inferior in every way, intellect, and thus forth and so on. And as a result, we're not suitable for anything but being slaves in the field. And that which was connected to it from breeding and thus forth and so on. So after slavery was abolished, do you had a fight for equality because there was a, uh, a clear disadvantage that black folks face as it relates to uh, opportunities in this country. And that's where you got the race for, or the call to equality. That's how it was sprung up. Meaning you're not simply superior to another based off your ethnicity. And you as a 
black person have just as much rights as a white person. No one's inferior, no one's no one's inferior to, no one's one no one's superior then, and thus forth and so on. But after a while, this call to equality morphed into a ver to, into different aspects different aspects of life. And one of the things it morphed into was equality between the two sexes. And it started off as women just wanting the right to be able to vote in this society and other such privileges that they didn't have that were held for men. And even from that, it morphed into something else. To the point now where you have women say, a man is not a need, but a privilege. A woman can do anything a man can do. And thus forth and so on. But in reality, all these statements and, and all these calls that this, uh, this, uh, call to equality that we find in this day and time between the two sexes are, that are being made is incorrect. It's incorrect Islamically. Now, when going back to the whole thing about uh, being superior or inferior based off skin color or ethnicity, then we know from the text of the Quran and the Sunnah, then that's Bata. Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala, he states, Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu, inna akramakum inda Allah atqaqum. Allah says, O oh mankind, we have made you from a male and a female, yani Adam and Eve. And we have created you all from a male and a female. And we have made you all into varying tribes and nations that, that, that you may get to know one another. And the, the most noble amongst you, human beings, with Allah, is he who has the most taqwa. That transcends <laughs> all ethnicities and colors and thus forth and so on. So we understand and the reason, one of the reasons why I'm saying this is because one of the claims for the enslavement of black folks in this country was that we were cursed by God. We weren't favored by God. That's why we have our dark skin. But Allah Ta'ala in this particular verse refutes that. The, no, the most noble of you all with the law are those that have a taqwa. The point that I'm making is that this particular call to equality in that aspect affected other areas of society and morphed into something that <clears throat> literally makes no sense. The reality is That Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala has defined as it relates to the man and woman clear rights and responsibilities. Status, rights, and responsibilities that shows that there is a difference between the two sexes. Now, saying that there's a difference between the two sexes is not saying the woman is like spittle unto the ground. A person's not saying that when you point this out. When a person says men and women are not equal, that doesn't mean that, it's, that a person is saying women are like spittle unto the ground. But if this statement is made by, to the average woman in this society, that's how they contextualize the statement. That's how they understand the statement due to this unrestricted cause of equality that makes no sense. That makes no sense. Again, we go back to the statement of Allah. 
بعضهم على بعض that the men are قوامون over the women on account of Allah giving preference to some over others to some over others now how are some of the ways that Allah has given preference to some over the others and before that that bad bima fadl Allah that bad is what you call sababiyah is giving you the cause or the reason the reason for what why men are called moon over women why they're the leaders and authorities over women on account of Allah giving favor or giving preference to some over others he's explaining why the stature or the status of the man is like this so now in order for us to safeguard falling into stupid stupidity that most women may uh, in this society from amongst the Kafir women of course from the stupidity of their contextual contextualization that we have to understand how this preference comes into play first as the ulama point out Allah gave the men pre the preference by burdening, burdening the men with the responsibility of prophethood and messengership. This is one of the ways. A woman has not been burdened with prophethood nor messengership. That is a burden or responsibility that was placed upon the shoulders of men. Two, al khilafa wal wilaya. That the burden of succession to the leadership of, leadership of the Prophet وسلم, was given to men, not to women, and authority over the entire Muslim community. This is a responsibility that the man has been burdened with. And again, I say burdened with because it's not a privilege. I, there's another is yeah, I mean, the, posi the position of Imam of, of the Masjid, for instance. That this is a responsibility that is given to the men and not the women. And certain acts of ibadah. The man has been burdened with fighting jihad, not the women. The man has been burdened with Salatul Jama'ah and Salatul Jumu'ah, not the women and thus forth and so on. All of these rights and responsibilities as it relates to the men and women that differ shows that men and women are not the same. And this is from an Islamic perspective. But even if we were to look at things at a logical perspective, and although I have more prepared for the subject, <coughs> my time is up. So I'm going to close out with this point, inshallah. Even when we look at things from a logical perspective, men and women are not the same. Let's take a look at the debate that's currently in this society now as it relates to transgender women. Yani men, <laughs> men that claim that they were really meant to be a woman. Men that claim that they were meant to be a woman. And so they start to take hormone, hormone pills to grow breasts, they grow their hair out, they start trying to dress like women and try to imitate women try to look like women, some go as far as to get sex changes and thus forth and so on. There is a debate in sports right now, in the sports world right now, should transgender women be allowed to compete in sports <laughs> against real women? Because these transgender women have a clear and obvious advantage over the women. A transgender woman, yani a man who's confused about his sexuality, 
was in some type of competition, uh, wrestling competition against other women. He's slamming the women around. No, he's slamming the women around. He's slamming the women around. And so you have some saying, oh no, they're transgender, they have a right to be here. Others saying, listen, man, this is a clear disadvantage right here. And others are saying, listen, maybe we should just make our own league for them. For those that are saying they should make their own, we should just make their, a, a league specific to them, that's their understanding that, look, they're not the same. They're not equal in that regard. They're not the same. And that's from a logic perspective. Anybody that says otherwise is clearly someone who the shaitan is laughing at. In closing, uh, let me just give some advice because in closing, let me skip down and I want to deal with these points real quick. We want to take a, we want to have a different outlook on fatherless homes. Again, we can't correct the, the children's well-being while fatherless homes exist within our communities because those homes are at a disadvantage. And so I want to look at some ways that we can start to correct those things. One is that we have to stop being hasty when getting married. We have to stop being hasty when getting married. You met the sister at 12 o'clock, you married her by mother. Some, some situations happen like that. We have to stop being hasty when getting married. And one of the things that when looking at this is look, Marry the type of woman that you're looking for. If, or for the women, marry the type of man that you're looking for. If you have a standard that's realistic, then I would advise you to go outside of your standard. Marry the type of spouse that you're looking for. That's my advice to the brothers and the sisters. Don't quote unquote settle for less. And then you're in a marriage telling your spouse, well, you know, I, you know, uh, I went against a lot my, my standard to marry you. If a woman tells a man that, he he hear of that one time, he may, okay, I heard that. But, you know. He hears it the second time, he's like, well, hold up, what's going on here? He is it the third or fourth time. He's like, yeah, I'm done with this. You're talking to me like I'm, you know, you have to lower your standards to marry me. No man is going to respect that. And I'm pretty sure no sister is going to respect the man telling her that. So the first advice would be to go after what you want. Go after what you want. Second, brothers and sisters have to ask important questions during the get to know you period. I noticed like back in LA, brothers would be having sit downs with Salafi sisters, asking them where is Allah. You think she don't know where Allah is? You think she don't know the answer? She's a Salafi sister, been in the Salafi community for years. But they're not asking important questions. What's your uh, medical history like? Do you have any type of ailments that cause you, causes you to take medication on a regular basis? Have you ever been abused as a child, regardless of this physically, sexually, or otherwise? What's your, your family structure like? like? Or do you come from a two-parent home? And if not a two-parent home, you come from a family where both parents were in your life. Or 
is your uh, is your fa your family structure uh, structure considered to be dysfunctional? You didn't know your father, or you met your father at the age of eighteen or nineteen, or you knew your father but he was a drug dealer, alcoholic, uh, not drug dealer, drug addict, alcoholic, and thus forth and so on. This is what you call dysfunctional. And I have to be honest. This type of dysfunction affects men and women differently. Men, in general, can can bounce back from the dysfunction of a, 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 a dysfunction a dysfunctional background of that nature, depending on how dysfunctional it is. Some women, or a lot of women, don't. It it, it shows in the family life. So the point that I'm making is ask important questions. This is somebody that you want that you're marrying with the hopes of spending the rest of your life with. Don't ask questions to a sister coming out of a Salafi community that as well known she probably knows. And even if she doesn't, you teach her. Or if you ask that, I'm not going to say that, that questions, questions of that nature are not important, but don't forget to ask about these other things as well. Don't forget to ask about those other things as well. Third advice I want to give is don't present yourself in a way that you're not. This is advice to the men and the women. Don't present yourself in a way that you're not. Be honest. Don't, be de don't deceive a brother or a sister. The Prophet said, He said, Man, Roshana Falaisa Minna. Whoever deceives us is not from us. Don't present yourself in a way that you're not. Another advice is that we have to magnify the affair of divorce, meaning we have to look at it as a very big thing, a tremendous thing. We can't look at it as something like, oh, you know, if I'm not feeling sister so-and-so, I'll just divorce her. We can't look at it like that. We have to look at it with, with a greater magnitude than that. We have an authentic narration that's found in the in Al-Adab Al-Mufrid <coughs> of Imam Al-Bukhari. It's upon the authority of Jabir ibn Abdullah. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he stated, Inna Iblis, يَضَعُوا أَرْشَهُ عَلَى الْمَاءِ ثُمَّ يَبْعَثُوا سُرَايَ That Iblis, he placed his throne over water and then he sent forth his troops. فَأَدْنَاهُمْ مِنْهُ مَنْزِلَةً أَعْظَمُهُمْ فِتْنَةً And the closest to him, as it relates to status, to the shaitan or to Iblis, from his troops that he sends out, as it relates to status, are those who are greatest as it relates to fitna, to stirring or causing fitna. Someone from amongst his troops comes and he says, I did such and such. And Iblis responds to him, You haven't done anything. You've done nothing. But then one comes to him and he says, Ma turaktuhu, hatu bainahu wa baina imra'atihi. He says, I didn't abandon this man until I caused a separation between him and his wife. Between him and his wife. Fayudinihi minhu. Shaitan or Iblis, he brings this troop close. He brings this one close and he says to him, Ni'ma ant. And he praising him, how excellent you are. How excellent you are. So we have to look at divorce in, in this magnitude. So we won't just slide in and out of marriage. So we won't just slide in and out of marriage. And then the last piece of advice is that when dealing with a marriage, 
that we don't become comfortable in our situation to the point we start to display the most disrespectful of character with our spouse because we're comfortable. I got her. Or he's with me. He ain't going nowhere. And so with that attitude, a person st starts to speak and act in a way that is unbefitting of a Muslim with their spouse. <clears throat> because this leads, this will lead to a person, to two people separating. You start to sin, you start to commit a sin. And it can lead to the separation of two people. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he said in the Hadith of Anas ibn Malik, and this, uh, excuse me, this na the narration is in Al Adab al Mufrid. The, the other last narration is in the Sahih Imam Muslim. He stated, and it, uh, a mad to wear death man, that two people don't love for the sake of, of Allah. And there's not a separation that is caused between them, except that it is a sin that one of the two has committed. Except that it is a sin that one of the two has committed. Now this narration, when you go into the explanation, is talking about two brothers having a huwa al-Islamiyyah. So if this is the case with two brothers, then it is yani min bab al that you apply this to two spouses. The two spouses. And so we want to keep these things in mind to ensure that we do away with this phenomena that's occurring in the black community of fatherless homes. We don't want that to affect our families and our communities, yani our Islamic communities. We have a different outlook on how uh, on families and how we go about handling things. And it's based off the text of the Quran and the Sunnah. So we have to apply that. Yeah. And with that, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.